welcome everybody to the webinar today. I'm really happy to have all of y'all here. Um, we're going to be talking about some winning tactics for e-commerce emails and going through a presentation with a little bit of Q&A at the end. So as we go along, feel free to type your questions into the questions box in your control panel, and we'll try to get through as many of them as we can. And the remainder ones, we may be following up afterwards to try to answer them as well. So for those of y'all who have missed it, um, we do have a handout section right now in the control panel as well, where you can download the ultimate guide to e-commerce emails. Uh, and that's a much more comprehensive guide than even what we're going through today. So it's about 80 pages or so, so it makes for some light pre-holiday reading. Um, with that said, without further ado, we're going, I'm going to share my screen and we'll get started with this. So there we go. Let's get started. All right. So the topic of today's webinar is about winning tactics for e-commerce emails. So we'll be primarily focused on some very tangible tactics that you can take away and utilize in your email marketing today that is very focused around engaging customers as well as making actual sales. So most of what you do today uh, and most of the uh, items we're covering today will be very helpful for actually generating sales for y'all. So to start, a little bit about Volusion. Now, I know a lot of y'all are already Volusion customers, but for the ones that are not, Volusion is a very fantastic e-commerce platform that really is built to accommodate everyone. So merchants, both big and small, have made a lot of success using Volusion, and there are a couple reasons for that. Primarily, first of all, there are a lot of stunning and very intuitive themes and a lot of design orientation and making your brand look and feel as well as conversion rates be very optimized because on top of the themes, Volusion actually has in-house marketing and design agencies that can help you uh, fine-tune your brand to make sure that it's exactly what you want. And moreover, there are zero transaction fees, which is uh, very atypical because a lot of the e-commerce platforms out there do charge you on the amount of transactions that you uh, carry out as a merchant, which is uh, not that great because as you grow, you end up paying more and more and more, uh, and you're pretty much penalized for your growth, whereas Volusion does not have that transactional fee. Moreover, here's a quick stat that's really interesting for me, uh, which is merchants tend to earn more than 2x on Volusion compared to their leading e-commerce competitor. And so if you're not on Volusion and you're interested in getting started, we actually have a little offer for you, which is 50% off your first month. And you can click on those links um, and go ahead and sign up. So we'll, we'll be dropping across the links and all of the slides afterwards anyway, so don't worry about having to screen capture or rush to copy down the links in your notebooks right now. With that said, a little bit about Essence of Email and why we're kind of qualified to talk to you about the topic of email marketing and the tactics. So we've had five years of experience as a company working only in e-commerce and only in email marketing. So very, very focused with the amount of work that we do and where our niche is. Uh, we've worked with over 200 e-commerce clients in North America and, and Australia over that time. On average, we're realizing 118 times ROI on the email marketing channel. And finally, last year, we made 18.7 million for our clients in email marketing attributable revenue. And then a quick introduction about myself. So my name is Xiaohui Wang, and I actually just go by X, so it's easy and nice to remember. Um, and I'm the founder of Essence Email, and I've been in the email marketing game for over six years and have seen a wide variety of different e-commerce retail shops, um, from solo operations all the way up to IR500 brands. And this is kind of the distilled version of all the tricks and tactics that I found to work really well for brands across the board and generating revenue and generating performance for the channel. So with all that introduction out of the way, let's dive into the meat of it. And here is what we're going to talk about, the three primary topics for today, which is first, a list growth, how to successfully grow your list and maintain and nurture it. Second, automations, 
and we'll focus primarily on three of the most effective email automation flows. And then thirdly, on campaigns and the various different tactics you can implement utilizing your email campaigns and newsletters. So because the webinar isn't uh, you know, five hours long, we won't be able to dive into every single possible aspect of each one of these, but nevertheless, we'll touch upon the most effective in this presentation. And as another reminder, there is a handout that goes much more in depth into all the granularity there. So feel free to download that as we go through. So to start, let's talk a little bit about list growth. So for any email marketing program to be successful, it's pretty intuitive and, and probably pretty obvious that you'll need to have an email list to begin with because if you don't have a list, then you don't have anybody to send your emails to. Um, so with that being said, then the question is, how do you best grow your list? What are some effective tactics in doing so? And, and why do you need to do that? And that's what we'll dive into right now. So first of all, here's a, a couple interesting stats. So for email list growth, um, first of all, email is quite effective as a channel, potentially up to 40 times as efficient as some other um, customer acquisition channels uh, for e-commerce. And second of all, on average, brands lose 20% of their mailing list each year just purely due to attrition which is maybe pretty surprising of a statistic because um, imagine, you know, like a lot of marketers might think, okay, well, I collected my email list, right? And then it's just constantly growing. But in fact, that just due to attrition, due to people being disengaged, due to people unsubscribing or spam complaining on your emails, you're naturally going to be losing a lot of your email list year on year. So that just makes it that much more important to continuously grow your list so that you're outpacing the attrition rates and actually realizing net list gain, but not only just net list growth, but also growth of subscribers that are actually valuable to you and who turn into customers and repeat customers. So a couple of methodologies that you can you can utilize to increase your list growth would be utilizing things like website pop-ups, uh, checkout email captures, you can run sweepstakes. If you're a very content or lifestyle driven brand, you can certainly have gated content, whether it's something like a series of videos or how to's or, or eBooks that has been very effective. Um, also utilizing the social media properties, whether it's on Facebook or Twitter or, or YouTube to drive more email list growth, because ultimately when you capture the email address, you're going to have one of the most robust sources of information on your, on your subscribers and one that you can communicate over and over again. Um, and then finally, some other ideas is utilizing actual offers through discount coupons. And if you run any sort of live events, uh, whether it's pop-up shops, whether it is, you know, conferences, et cetera, uh, that's also an opportunity to capture emails. So I want to introduce one of the tactics that is has been very, very effective for growing your email list, which is the exit intent pop-up. Um, now, this is actually differentiated from some of the welcome pop-ups that you might see. Uh, happen on a lot of sites that you visit, whether it's your competitor sites or just other general e-commerce sites. One of the things is while welcome pop-ups can be pretty effective, um, they usually are a bit disruptive uh, and pop-ups in general may be a little bit disruptive, but with the exit and intent pop-up, one of the key features of it is we're really looking at drilling down on a narrower set of, or of visitors who can potentially even see it so that not everybody who lands on a landing page will just automatically get it. And we do that by utilizing platforms that allow us to, to track mouse movement. So I'm gonna click through and show you that. Um, and so instead of just popping up right away, it's actually based on an advanced algorithm that detects the user's activity through if they're using mouse movements or how fast they're moving that or on mobile with back buttons and other user actions that indicate their intent to bounce off the site and to basically leave your site and potentially never come back. So um, already when we're serving up the, the pop-up and the intent pop-up and looking at 
who we're targeting, it's a smaller subset of people versus just a general visitor who may have been um, going down the path to purchase anyways. So on average, we're seeing a, a impression to conversion rate of about 3.9%, um, just under 4% there. And uh, that is the average, so the range is um, a little bit bigger than that. I've seen ones that convert even upwards until 10%. So definitely room for capturing a lot of emails just by virtue of, look, of piggybacking on on-site traffic, and especially the on-site traffic that's bouncing that potentially you would lose anyways. Now, the way to sort of optimize for this type of pop-up would be to generally offer some sort of incentive. Now, this could be um, this could be a discount code, it could be free shipping, it could be a free gift with purchase, maybe even a giveaway as we have here. So there's definitely a lot of different possibilities on what you can offer as incentive, but from what we've seen, having some sort of tangible incentive is going to increase the conversion rate or the subscription rate to the pop-up. Uh, we also find that occupying more real estate potential particularly around the center of the screen. So introducing a pop-up instead of, you know, a small thing in the header or footer, actually having it, you know, be a little bit more disruptive there to, to be more eye-catching and uh, kind of forcing the message to, to be shown there. Um, and also just keep it simple. Like you don't have to go super elaborate on the design. Uh, you want to have it on brand, of course, and, and definitely, you know, looking nice, but at the same time, you don't have to, you know, have the Mona Lisa on that in order to make it effective. In fact, keeping it simple, nice, the messaging straightforward is generally going to improve conversion rates. Uh, and then you certainly can introduce things like for urgency, such as a countdown timer, which is very effective in getting people to take that final action. So beyond that, I wanted to go into a little bit more about email automation since once you have your email list, then there's the question of how you best attack the list. And generally speaking, when we market to our subscriber list, we, we do so in two ways. One is automations and one is campaigns. And we'll talk about campaigns as a third point in today's webinar, but let's talk about automations because this is probably one of my favorite areas to implement for email marketers, uh, especially in the e-commerce space. So first off, a little bit of background on what email automation is and why it is so effective in your toolbox in terms of having an effective channel. So first of all, basically email automation refers to automated emails that are sent from your uh, email service provider platform. Um, so that's something like a MailChimp, Klaviyo, Drip that you utilize to actually send your marketing emails. And it is done in response to actual user actions or characteristics on your website or other platforms that they engage with your brand on. So you can imagine that as a trigger point. So let's say, you know, I visit a particular page. That could be a trigger point. I add an item to a cart. That could be a trigger point. I made a purchase. That could be a trigger point. And all of those triggers then set in motion a sequence of emails that are automated based on a set of logic that sends to particular subscribers who have fulfilled all of those logic criteria. So the end result is you're generally gonna see very high engagement rates compared to normal batch and blast emails. Um, you're also going to be able to generate more repeat sales. Um, and one of my favorite results from that is you can, you can get a lot out of email automations by putting up the upfront work and then letting them run. So while an optimal, optimal email program requires not only setting up the automations, but continuously A-B testing and tweaking it, you're able to capture the lion's share of the results by you know, doing a sprint, setting up the automations, and then potentially not touching them for a little bit. So that, that definitely will help with all the, you know, potentially time-strapped and or resource-strapped <laughs> uh, brands out there uh, that, are, that are on the growth phase. And then finally, the last point there, as I mentioned, is there's always ex opportunities to expand and have more advanced sequences, more touch points in your existing sequences, and to optimize by A-B testing various elements within those sequences.
So a, little, a few benchmark numbers just to give you an idea of just the general email channel as well as how automations could potentially fit into it. So on average, this is panel data across um, our, our clients, which says that on average, we're looking at about just a tad under 23% of total store revenue coming from the email channel. And keep in mind, this spans a variety of niches. So some niches actually uh, would be below this and some are well above this. For example, uh, fashion and apparel tends to average out at about 35%. And I've seen um, more than a handful of brands easily clip over the 50% of revenue coming from email. Um, when in that particular niche. Whereas if you're in, let's say, furniture or um, items that just have lower repurchase rates, then it might be lower than that 23%. But nevertheless, the point is there's a lot of money in the email marketing channel if you do it correctly. In fact, when we look at the breakdown between the channel revenue, we see that about 45% on average come from automations and then 55% come from the manual campaigns. Um, which is roughly a 50-50 split, uh, meaning that automations can be very, very effective in generating a, a large portion of your email marketing revenue. Uh, and then a couple other stats there. On average, we're seeing about 21% open rates on emails, 2.5% uh, click rates, and 0.8% conversion rates. So then I wanted to show y'all a example of a very basic actually automations map just to get the juices flowing and, and get some visualization here. So as you can see here, what we have is the user or your subscriber at the center of all these actions. And what happens is when they take certain actions like abandoning cart, like viewing a product page or making a purchase or even subscribing and not having made a purchase, then that triggers the sequence of emails that are targeted towards them based on those actions that they've taken. So you can see here, and we'll be able to go through a couple of these in, in the following slides, but not all of them. Um, you can see here that when a user abandons cart, they go down the cart recovery sequence. If they're viewing a particular product page but didn't purchase, they get a browse abandonment email. If they do make a purchase, and it actually differentiates between first and first time customers and repeat customers and gives them a different experience because of course, you want to treat your VIP customers a little differently. And, uh, and also a welcome series and a, um, a win back series. So this is definitely not the universe of all possibilities in terms of automations, but this is definitely some of the more effective ones and some of the core that form the foundation for your automations and flows for your email program. So with that said, let's go through three of the more highly effective ones. So the first type of sequence would be the post-purchase email sequence, which effectively is triggered when a customer makes a purchase. Now, a couple quick stats there. When compared to an average email campaign, we're actually seeing uh, more than double the open rate, uh, more than like 5x the click rate, and potentially 90% or higher revenue per recipient. So while the volume of emails here is going to be lower because you know it requires a customer making a purchase, it nevertheless is pound for, for pound very effective as an email sequence for generating revenue, but also generating a lot of engagement. And with that said, there are a couple reasons for this. So first of all, when a customer just makes a purchase, they're usually at an emotional high point which is um, if you just imagine yourself as a consumer, whenever you make a purchase of something that you want, right, you're generally pretty happy. You get that sort of temporary dopamine spike there. Uh, and because of this, you know, we want to formulate an onboarding experience through the post-purchase email sequence that is, you know, capitalizing on the emotional high point, also utilizing that to generate potentially Secondary actions, for example, joining your points program, your loyalty program, updating their preferences page to give you some more information to segment later on, um, following on social media, and even potentially just making another purchase. Um, the post-purchase sequence is a, a great opportunity, even as early as order confirmation or shipping confirmation, to introduce some more products that they might like that could be an impulse buy or could just be a very complimentary product 
that they can just make an immediate repurchase decision on, and that will increase you know, the lifetime value of that customer immediately. Um, moreover, you can see here, basically the customer starts a journey by making a purchase, and then there are the traditional transactional emails that go out, such as order confirmation, shipping confirmation, and you may have it set up to actually give like shipping updates or a couple more pieces there, but those are some fairly standard ones there. And beyond that, then we actually reach a decision point that decides between whether they're a first-time customer or if they're actually a repeat customer. Because if they're a first-time customer, then we're going to gear the messaging a little bit differently towards them and tell them a bit more about the brand, get them excited, um, and then offer them you know, opportunities to review the product and so on and so forth. Versus if they are a repeating customer, then we should speak to that and thank them for being you know, one of our top customers, perhaps a VIP if they bought multiple, multiple times, um, and then just really tailoring the message and making them feel special so that they'll, they'll continue to engage with our brand and, and continue to repurchase over and over again. So beyond that, the here are some examples of uh, some good first customer welcome, post-purchase welcome emails that we've seen. Um, and this is, you know, the, the, there are a lot of brands that are doing some, some good job there, but uh, nevertheless, just want to show you some visuals in terms of um, ones that we really particularly like. So the next email sequence that I want to talk about is a browse abandonment email sequence. So the basic concept of a browse abandonment email is the trigger point where a visitor, or they have to be a subscriber first of all, but a subscriber visits a particular page on your site. Usually when we refer to browse abandonment, what we mean is a product or category oriented page. Now it doesn't necessarily have to be restricted to that because you can certainly have browse abandonment triggers based on if they viewed your frequently asked questions page or your resources page or a particular video, all of that's definitely possible and on select basis might make a lot of sense. But generally speaking, you want to sort of retarget people who are demonstrating purchase intent by actually you know, browsing through certain product or category pages and hence why we've segregated those in, in this particular presentation. So um, uh, a few stats there. First of all, a little over half of people would actually open the browse abandonment email that you sent following their visit. Um, and we actually have very strong click-through rates there at almost 11% on average. Um, and then average revenue per recipient at a dollar and 40 cents, which is pretty strong given, given um, the, the volume that's being sent. So with that said, the purpose of the follow-up emails is effectively to showcase the product or category that they viewed. Um, and then try to get them to come back to the site and ultimately make that purchase. Now, a lot of times what we also do is have some dynamic recommended products underneath that to, in case, you know, they were looking at a particular product and, and it may not be exactly what they want, but showcasing other similar ones or ones that they may want could increase the click-throughs to get them back on the site, back to shopping, and potentially converting. Now, generally speaking, we want to keep this sequence pretty short and tight. So in terms of the delays on the first email, we tend to at most look at about a one day delay and sometimes less than a day delay, you know, perhaps a couple hours even. Um, and then finally, we, we look to, you know, to have one or maybe two emails in the sequence and not really have it built out uh, really, really long because it is a little bit higher in the funnel and um, have more coverage and more volume come through. And here are a couple of examples of browse abandonment emails uh, around the product and uh, around, well, I guess the Dollar Shave Club one is a little bit more general there. Um, basically, it, it mentions that, hey, look, like you're, you've been looking at particular products, here, here it is, come back and shop, and also here might be some other additional interesting products or categories for you to click through. All right, and then the final, this is actually almost two, two sequences. Uh, it can be two sequences, depending on how you have it set up. 
But the final automation that I want to chat about today is the card abandonment slash checkout abandonment sequence. Um, now, as a retailer, you're probably familiar on the importance of redeeming abandoned shopping carts because just a couple stats there, you know, three and four shopping carts abandoned in 2018, um, while at the same time, almost half of people open card abandonment emails and there's quite a bit of conversion coming from that. So uh, to in order to maximize your sales, abandoning shopping carts, abandoning um, or recovering abandoned shopping carts and recovering abandoned checkouts is very important in driving up that ultimate revenue. And to that point, how we like to structure it is typically we want to have a three touch point sequence. Um, and you can see on the right there, that's a fairly standard structure for it. Now, a lot of times we can differentiate um, down the line and, and split it out depending on, let's say, you know, average order value they have um, in their cart, or rather the, the amount they have in the cart, and or if they're repeat purchasers. So we can certainly tailor the experience differently than what's presented here. And also if, you know, you have certain um, map restrictions or anything around discounting, like certainly, you know, don't violate those. But uh, usually how we structure it is on the first email, it's more of a friendly reminder. Uh, on the second email, that's where we potentially could introduce a hard incentive or a discount. And then on the third card abandonment email, um, looking to drive urgency with last chance sort of messaging. So um, what I alluded to also earlier about the differentiation potentially between cart and checkout abandonment is that if you think about it, when a user comes to the site and they're browsing, right, the first part that they'll interact with would be actually looking at a particular product, which if they then end up closing out from your site from there, then they'll be getting that browse abandonment email that I've talked about before. But then if they keep going down that funnel and they add something into their shopping cart, that's the next potential point they could abandon, right? So they have something in their shopping cart, but they haven't actually gotten to checkout yet. So that would potentially trigger a cart abandonment sequence. And then finally, if they added something to cart and they're in the process of checkout but never placed the order, then that would potentially trigger a checkout abandonment sequence, which is a little bit further down the funnel than the abandoned cart sequence. So I like to make that distinction because a lot of times uh, the abandoned cart sort of terminology is used sort of all-encompassing. And, and in reality, it's uh, kind of two distinct steps in the user journey for purchasing. So with that said, uh, a little bit more info here. Generally, in the emails themselves, we tend to show the card products or the checkout products with um, a pretty clear call to action to come back and finish their checkout. Uh, and then also on the first email, we tend to keep it fairly short, anywhere from 15 minutes to four hours in terms of the delay, and then going in 24-hour increments past that. And a couple of examples of abandoned cart emails that we picked that are pretty interesting. It's also a, a good place to either, like being straightforward is definitely an easy way to go for that, but if your brand voice allows for it, abandoned cart emails are one of those emails you can get pretty creative with your copywriting, with your uh, actual design for. So if you have maybe a bit of a cheeky brand, certainly build in your brand, uh, brand voice into that abandoned cart email. All right, so with that said, I want to shift gears towards the second piece of the email marketing equation. So as you, as you guys remember that I had mentioned before that typically email marketing programs tend to have two important pieces, which is email campaigns, which are kind of those one-off emails that you pre-plan and send, and then the automation. Now we've gone through automation, so it's time to talk about the other side of that equation, which is the email campaign. So I'll, I'll be talking about a couple of pieces here, primarily resend, A-B testing, as well as planning your campaign. So we'll start with the first things first, which is planning your email marketing calendar. Now, we worked with, uh, like I mentioned in the beginning, we worked with over 200 clients at this point, um, various different brands and various different niches. And one of the consistent elements that we've noticed uh, and patterns that we've noticed, now it's not every single client and every single brand, but a lot of the brands that come to us, 
uh, there tends to be some disorganization around the email marketing planning. And that's actually one of the critical pieces in order to make sure your, your email marketing is up to par, it's consistent, and that you're sending out the right campaigns with the right parameters and continuously testing it out. So um, we always like to stress the importance of having a sound plan, especially going into holiday season, for example, and, and going into high season for your various brands. Once you have your planning down, it makes all the execution that much more, that much easier. Now, I just want to show you an example, and this is a truncated example of an email marketing calendar. Um, we're using just, uh, in this case, a um, more more of like an Excel spreadsheet or a Google Docs spreadsheet. You can certainly build that out a lot more. And here, I just want to show you a couple of elements that we put into that plan. And you would imagine also for each one of these, there will be a follow-up content brief that's much more detailed around um, the particular links and particular content for each campaign theme. But nevertheless, including some of these elements during your campaign planning is going to help a lot. For example, including when, at what time, and what date you're deploying the email, um, what is the general theme of the email, the status of your execution on it, subject line or subject line, if you have various different variants and you're A-B testing subject lines, um, also, the target subscriber group, so the particular segments or lists that you're looking to send that particular email to, including the ones that you want to exclude. So sometimes you particularly want to not send to a group of contacts because strategically that makes sense. So including that in your email marketing planning is also going to be very helpful for when you're actually scheduling emails, you're not racking your brain and trying to figure out who you plan to send to. Um, and also document your A-B test. Now, not every single email campaign do you need to have an A-B test for, but generally speaking, if you're under this concept of continuing to improve and optimize your email marketing, then certainly you want to document the A-B test you want to run on the relevant campaign. Uh, and then finally, with some notes, so certain campaigns may have you know, particular exclusions and or restrictions, and so adding some notes in that column will help you dial in as you execute on them. So with that out of the way, I want to talk a little bit about A-B testing. Uh, A-B testing is one of those darlings of the you know, digital marketing world, and email is no different. Um, now with email, there are some particular considerations as well as ways we approach A-B testing, which is what I'll address here. So the very first step, as with anything, is to sort of plan out your A-B testing, right? So first you want to identify what type of test you want to run. Then you want to slot that into your calendar. Um, and then from there, you'll then go and actually execute and create the variant of those A-B tests. So to start, identifying the types of A-B testing that you want to execute again. So this is not a comprehensive list by any means, but a couple of the main areas that you can A-B test would be looking at things like send time, looking at the layout of your actual campaign, um, the content, whether you're showing you know, promos or, or product listings or otherwise in your email. The subject line, of course, is a very um, tried and true one. Delays on your automations. So I alluded to earlier, you know, if you're running a card abandonment email uh, sequence, then you certainly can test out the initial delays and the follow-up delays to optimize for when people are most engaged. Um, and also the segmentation on who you're actually sending the emails to. So while you're approaching and identifying the types of A-B testing, a couple things to really sort of be aware of. Um, number one is something I see as a mistake that a lot of people tend to make with A-B testing, which is making a decision based on a potential false positive and making a decision too early. So uh, generally speaking, when you're running A-B tests, you want to strive for statistical significance, which is primarily driven by a combination of the size of the difference between the variants uh, in terms of the metrics and the volume of transactions. So a lot of times if you're you know, letting, you're only running one test or you're only running for a short amount of time, then what ends up happening is 
that you tend to run into false positives, and that's potentially worse than having an inconclusive test. So if you like, you see like, okay, well, you know, subject line A is is the winning variant, and I'm going to use that for the future. But in reality, you're only basing it on a small sample size. Uh, and it ends up actually being the worst variant, then you're shooting yourself in the foot by utilizing what you thought was a winning variant into the future and actually sub-optimizing your campaign. Um, moreover, another couple of sort of tips around A-B testing is we always like to focus on repeatable learnings. So if something is a, a one-time thing and it's hard to take that learning and, and use it in the future, then we tend to shy away from that and or we deprioritize that type of test. So one example of this is, let's take subject line testing, for example. Um, now, subject line testing in and of itself can be very beneficial, but we I, I prefer to do subject line tests on automations first versus campaign emails. And the reason is, let's say you're doing a subject line test on that you know first time customer welcome email, right? When you find the one that actually wins, you immediately just start using that winning variant. And all future people who get that customer welcome email will get that winning variant in the most optimal version. Now, if you're subject line testing on campaigns, let's say you send out a very specific campaign about you know, some event that's happening, right? And even though you might find a variant that wins, that might there might be so many factors in it that's specific to that type of email or that event email that it's hard to utilize the learnings from that into future emails. So you're not really sure sometimes if it's you know the capitalization or if there's it's the punctuation or emoji or something that's causing the the difference in open rates. So it just becomes a bit harder to repeat that learning. So in those cases I will probably prioritize one that can be repeated over one that's harder to repeat and potentially uh, one that is more prone to false positives. And then finally, this uh, acronym of CANI, um, which uh, stands for Constant and Never-Ending Improvement. So going into A-B testing with the mentality of like, hey, I'm always going to look to optimize uh, my campaigns, my automations, and my email marketing in general. And by getting the incremental gains, whether it's 1% here, 5% there, over time, those are going to accrue and you're going to see some pretty sizable lifts in the performance of your program. And then finally, um, once you find the winning variants of your test, then taking advantage of that and implementing those winners, uh, but then not stopping there, but going into the next phase of the next set of A-B tests and continuing from there. So with A-B testing, after you plan and execute, you also want to make sure you have tracking in place. So one thing I've noticed is, you know, some of the brands we work with, um, they, they would, you know, do some A-B testing and, and, and that's good, but they don't tend to track it very well. So what ends up happening is you sort of do your A-B testing and then you lose the learnings. And if there's any, you know, personnel changes or time passes by, it's hard to then refer back to what you learned in the past. And sometimes you end up repeating tests that were already conclusive in the past. So we're a big fan of actually tracking results. Uh, and then be able to refer back to it at any point in time and then continuously improve upon those results. So um, the, er the areas here would be, the basics would be just creating a tracking sheet with the key metrics, right? Identifying which variants there are and what the baseline numbers are, and then, compare, and then compiling the winners and the insights once you get a good grasp of what the winners are. So, and this is a very basic example, but just to show you, it can be as simple as a couple rows in a spreadsheet. Um, and here is one example where we're testing just a delay um, for one particular email. And we just basically track the amount sent, um, the conversion rate, the open rate, the click rate, the revenue per recipient, and some of the revenue metrics. And ultimately here, in deciding on what's the most important metric, which generally tends to be you know, the, the revenue-driven metrics that kind of is where, where the dominoes fall. Uh, and so in this case, even though open rates were tiny bit below for the second version and the click rates were a little bit below on the, on the second version, the revenue per recipient is, is fairly significantly higher. 
um, as well as conversion rates a tad higher too. So in this case, we were deciding on the um, that metric as as the critical metric and hence the second version as the most important one. Now, this doesn't necessarily always hold true. For example, if you're running a subject line test, you may be just testing for driving the most amount of opens since subject lines have the uh, the most leverage and uh, on driving people to open versus the ultimate conversion. So you might decide on utilizing a different metric as the critical metric to judge against. So summing up A-B testing and moving on to the, the final piece here, which is talking about resend. Um, now, just a quick definition on what I mean by resend. It's basically a recycled email campaign that is later used to resend to either the entire list, but more often a portion of the original list, primarily the people who did not open or did not convert from the original send. Uh, and, and one of the main advantages here is as a retailer and as a brand, oftentimes there are limited resources internally and creating emails take up a lot of those resources. So. The purpose of a resend from a retailer perspective really is to help reduce the re resource demands on continuously creating a large batch of new emails and being able to recycle some effective old emails and uh, and ultimately extend the capacity of your team. Um, from a subscriber perspective, they can potentially get a second exposure to good emails and another chance to engage because we all know the inbox is somewhat flooded these days and it's easy for emails to get lost in the mix. And sometimes you just have to send more than once in order to get a subscriber to open and ultimately click and convert. So a couple of stats here, and these are more panel stats. The, the actual results vary quite a bit. Sometimes I see recent actually out clip the original email open rate. Um, but original email open rates at around like 26.7% would imply the resend open rate may be adding an incremental 8.7% there. Um, and this is this is taken from more industry data saying the best timing for resend is three days after original email. Of course, that's a very blanket statement. Um, it varies depending on the the nature of the original email. For example, if you're sending, you have a flash sale, right? Like there's no way you're sending three days after the original email. You probably want to send a couple hours after that, um, or if it's during particular holidays and such. So take that with a grain of salt and, and modify accordingly. But generally speaking, waiting a couple days after original email for a resend um, can be very good. And generally, which emails to be resent? Um, well, this is pretty straightforward, high performing emails. So emails that do well, then it's uh, it's good to resend those because if they're low performing, you don't really want to increase the frequency of low performing emails and potentially induce more churn on your list um, with emails that don't actually drive engagement or performance. So resends and their thresholds. So a couple tips around that. So number one, I would say don't blindly resend every single email, right? Um, just to go hand in hand with the high performance element of it, like look at emails that are actually performing and then utilize those and potentially resend them. And the ones that don't do so well, just leave them and you know, don't send them again. Um, and then beyond that, one way to look at that is just look at your historical performance, right? Like what are your averages? What are your medians around engagement rates, around conversions and revenue re per recipient? Um, so that you get a good gauge of what an average campaign email produces. And from there, one, one simple way to do, like, draw a threshold is just look at, like, what the average is and then say, hey, like, the emails that perform above this average, I'll potentially resend. And the ones that, you know, perform below this average, we don't consider them as candidates for resend. So that, that's a very sort of, like, rule of thumb way of looking at it, but certainly some easy place to start by just taking those averages and, and drawing a line in the sand there. And you can continue to refine that model as you move forward. And here's an example that doesn't really abide by the three days after rule, but also is very interesting in terms of utilizing and recycling emails and garnering more results from it. So um, this is an email where the original email we sent had you know, pretty on par open rates, click rates, and, and, and generated revenue. And then what we end up happening is 
resending this three times. Now, certainly not to the entire original list, and there were different targeting rules in place, but nevertheless, the first time we resend was three, acts, three weeks after the original email, and it actually generated a little bit higher open rate than the original and higher click rate. Um, not, not quite as much revenue there, but nevertheless, like nothing to sneeze at. Uh, and then we resent it six months after, and then finally seven months after as well. And now if you aggregate all of that, what you can see is the resend revenue actually accounts for 23K, um, which outpaces almost more than two to one the original email revenue sent. So if you had only sent that campaign one time, you're, you, you would have captured that 10K in revenue, but then you would have lost out on the additional 23K. And on top of this, this is a very efficient one because effectively you're taking the work done on the creative design of the original email and then recycling it. And then finally, this email then can become a good evergreen content for your brand to utilize you know, every few months, sending it to the new subscribers who've never seen it, um, or putting it into your welcome sequence as one of the touch points for people coming in to always get it, um, and otherwise being utilized uh, across the board for your other email sets. Um, now, of course, you have to be cognizant of this, right, for context. If it is a one-time sale, like there's no way you're going <laughs> to continue resending it because it's not relevant anymore. But if it's something that is more evergreen and people can be exposed to that con content over and over again, then it certainly benefits you to look at the high performers and resend them. All right, so thank you for sitting through that presentation. Hopefully that was helpful. And um, from here, I'm going to take a look at some of the questions that came in and uh, we'll run, uh, we'll, we'll get through a couple of those and uh, then we'll conclude the webinar from there. So let me see here, I'm just gonna take one. Oh, so, someone missed the introduction, sorry. <laughs> you can go back in. <laughs> And, and look at the recording there. Um, someone was asking about downloading the handouts. So the handout is on your control panel and there's a section that says handouts, one out of five. And if you click on the toggle there, you'll be able to download the PDF. Um, and then you mentioned another question is, do you have any pop-up email subscribe features? So usually we're utilizing probably a third party for that. So, you know, there, there's a couple of vendors that we like to use, um, Just Uno, Privy, those are all good vendors. Uh, and then there are a couple others on the marketplace as well. So we tend to go with sort of best of breed um, third party vendors there. And here is one that is a little bit more evolved, which is how to handle contacts that sign up via sweepstakes. Um, mentioning that potentially they have a higher risk of generating lower quality contacts um, because people might just only be interested in winning some free stuff and not really in you know actually engaging or, or purchasing from us so that's actually a really good question because the sources of where you get your subscribers is not necessarily all created equal um, in fact you know we know for certain they're not created equal and if you're running things like sweepstakes, especially with other brands and not to your own um, visitors, then it tends to generate people who are more tire kickers who are looking for free stuff and not really converting. So one way we handle that is, first of all, they'll, they'll fall through a, a welcome sequence. And generally we tend to have a differentiated welcome sequence specific to that sweepstakes. Um, and the approach there is we actually get more aggressive right so the idea is the contacts themselves may be lower quality so they they're going to fall off the engagement trend pretty quickly so we want to put some more offers in front of them um, send them emails in in a in a higher frequency to then figure out which ones are engaging which ones are converting and which ones are not and tend to be dead weight. And for the ones that don't engage and are dead weight, we do want to clean them off our list faster. So to protect the integrity of our list and the sender reputation of our list. And someone's asking, we're established and already selling via Evolution. Do you offer e-commerce services to implement what's being discussed? 
Uh, the answer is absolutely. We'll be sending in more info um, afterwards as well. Um, you can certainly also visit us at essenceofemail.com or shoot us our, an email at info at essenceofemail.com. And we'll get back to you and certainly chat about how we can potentially help. Then let me see, what's the question? Okay, and then there's a question about card abandonment and how do you send an email when all that is logged is the potential customer's address? Okay, so I, I assume what's meant here is the physical address of that customer. Um, so there's a short answer and there's a more advanced answer that could potentially be, um, it could potentially work better if you have like a large volume where you're only getting a physical address and not, not the email address. So first of all, the short answer is you, you need an email address <laughs> to, to send, right? So if they're not leaving an email address or they're not an existing subscriber who's on your list that you're able to track through um, them, you know, their whole user journey on your site, then ultimately you, you can't send the email because you need the email address to send an email. But that being said, the more advanced answer is actually if you have um, even like first name, address, some other identifier that is logged, there are ways to do what's called a reverse append, where you look at database services and you say, hey, look, I have these customer profiles where I don't have the email address, but I have some more information. Um, and when you run that list through the reverse append service, um, it's going to generate some, it's going to basically look into the back end of their entire database and match with emails that are associated with that uh, physical address. So while it's not necessarily going to be 100% hit rate, um, it could potentially redeem and fill in the gaps of some of the consumers and customers who you don't have the email address for. And that will enable you to send the emails. Oh, okay, sorry, <laughs> I just read that. Um, you meant the IP address, yeah. With the IP, I think that that's much tougher. Um, I don't think the re reverse append is really gonna work on, on the IP um, level, but uh, certainly if you have other information such as you know bill address and et cetera, you can send the emails or rather get the emails to be able to send. Um, how do we view the recording? We'll be sending that out um, later on. As well, there will be a, a, I believe, a blog post that follows up with this, as well as probably some email communication. Um, if you're registered, we'll we'll send that after. And let's see what's the next one? Okay, so there's a there's a good question about unsubscribe rates for automation emails. So the the question is. If we're sending a lot of automated emails to the customers, then the unsubscribe rates may be very high, and how do we manage that unsubscribe rate? Um, so first of all, I, I'm gonna challenge the premise of the fact that unsubscribe rates will be very high. So the automated emails actually tend to see very low unsubscribe rates because they're so targeted based on the actions that consumers take versus like potentially irrelevant emails that were sent and they didn't want them. So from all the data that I've seen across clients, the automated emails actually see like relatively low unsubscribe rates and, and thus it's not actually something to worry about as much. Now with the campaign emails, that's an area where you potentially could see high unsubscribe rates. And the way we tend to approach that is we tend to segment our list into people based on how much they're engaging with your emails. So let's say someone tends to open every single one of your emails, they're clicking through each email, that particular subscriber is one that's not very likely to unsubscribe, even if we're sending them, you know, let's say, you know, a couple emails a month or even potentially a couple emails per week. So, so for those folks, we, we segment them out and we're able to send them at our highest frequency. But then for ones that may only open an email every once in a while or have gone more dormant, then instead of, sending them a bunch of email, we tend to scale back on the cadence and the frequency. So we may only send them one of the, the best emails that month, right? And, and, and lower the frequency so that they're not getting annoyed by having too many emails they end up not engaging with. So that, that's one way on the, more so on the campaign side than automation side for modulating the unsubscribe rates. 
Here's another question, which is any tips to make sure your emails don't go into spam or junk? Um, yes, uh, and that's a topic of deliverability, which is a very uh, deep rabbit hole that could potentially be jumped on. But quick tips there is number one, make sure your sending infrastructure is set up correctly. So look into things called SPS and DKIM. Um, those sound scary, but basically they are authentication things you can do with your web host to make sure your emails are authenticated and when you're sending out those emails that um, the incoming servers are you know matching that and then seeing that you're not a spammer and not a spoofer uh, that's one way now the other way is to just maintain high engagement rate that's one of the keys especially with getting into the inbox in gmail and and pretty soon some of the other email providers as well uh, which means basically when you're sending an email, you want to make sure as many people are positively engaging with that as possible. So opening, clicking, marking as important, adding to whitelist. And the way to do that is by, clean, by keeping a clean email list. So when you're sending, like I alluded to before, you're not just blanket sending to everybody with every single campaign, but really looking at who on your list is this campaign relevant to and who on your list would potentially engage. And then that way, as a whole, when you're sending emails, then you're, you're sending a positive signal every time that you're a good sender, that your, your subscribers want your emails. And then over time, that's going to build up a positive sender reputation and help you stay in the inbox versus getting you know, put into um, spam. Yeah, here's, um, here's a question about reverse append. Does it work with GDPR and is it allowed? Um, I don't think I am qualified to speak to that. <laughs> I think you should certainly look into more legal resources around that. Um, but with GDPR, it is, I will say GDPR and also some of the um, other like non-US based legislation tends to be a lot more strict, right? So if I were to, you know, posit an answer right now, I would say no, like don't do reverse append with GDPR because one of the premises around that is that it has to be explicitly opt-in, right? So if you're getting a non-email address and then just some customer profile info and you're reverse appending and then just adding them on the list, like they're, they never explicitly opted into your email program for sure, right? So that by nature violates one of the tenets of GDPR and things like, you know, Castle, which is in Canada and, and so on and so forth. So I would say, you know, strictly just by that logic, um, reverse appending and then, you know, marketing according to that probably doesn't make that much sense. Um, okay. Uh, oh, and here's a question. Do people usually use different programs outside of Illusion for emails? Um, the answer is, yeah. So uh, regardless of whether it's Illusion or anywhere else, uh, we tend to use some specific um, third-party email platforms to to extend the functionality now evolution certainly has some functionality built in right and uh but for a very robust and, and sophisticated email marketing program we tend to veer on the side of introducing some best of breed technology specifically geared towards that and utilizing that to really power your email marketing program all right, well, I think we're coming up on the hour mark here. So um, I'm unfortunately going to be stopping the, the Q&A here. And uh, yeah, thank you, you all for jumping on today. Hopefully you're able to get some nice takeaways that you can implement. Um, and a reminder here, of course, if you're interested or have uh, any further questions, um, you can certainly visit us at essenceofemail.com. We have a nice blog that has a lot of info there, um, or email us at info at of email com. And if you're not a current Volusion customer and are interested in testing out Volusion or replatforming, there is a 50% discount on the first month of signups that is included in the link, which will be in the slides. So again, thank you all and have a great rest of your Tuesday.